Amen and amen. It's good to see you this morning. Welcome to church. I'm glad that you're here. Aren't you? Aren't you? All right. Praise the Lord, making sure. The last of our series on this message is entitled No Turning Back, The Keys to Finishing Well. And by the way, the finish line's a lot closer than it's ever been and probably closer than what most of us realize. But uh, it is important that we do finish well. I look back after having been saved as many years as I've been saved and looking back at so many people who, uh, who you know, you had such high hopes and expectations for finishing the race well that you can't even find them on the track anymore. If, maybe you have friends like that and how disheartening that is. There's a lot of warnings throughout the New Testament about about this issue of not ending up shipwrecking your faith, as the scripture says in one place, that we can finish well. We don't, just because others bail out doesn't mean we have to bail out. Just because others would quit, we don't quit. We keep moving forward. We keep being what God's called us to be. We keep doing what God's called us to do. We keep loving Jesus. Let me put it in simple terms. Amen. You just keep serving the Lord. But there are some things that have to be done in your own spiritual walk in life. It's amazing that through the grace of God, you know, we have been so well supplied God has given us what we need to be what he's called us to be. We talk about that often. So the hope and the, the, the blessing of that is, is that we can finish well. We can be what God's called us to be. We shouldn't have to be afraid of tomorrow. There should be great expectations in our, in our life about what God has planned and what God is up to and what God is doing. Great things are ahead for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world's getting dimmer day by day, the political scenario, the cultural scenario. I mean, things just look like they get worse and worse and worse. Amen. <laughs> but for the believer, you know, it's a bright star shining. It gets brighter every day. And so we keep looking for that blessed hope as the scripture calls him because the day's coming when he shall appear. But we can finish well and we don't, we, we shouldn't be of that crowd who just bails out and quits. You know, and Paul writes this letter in second Peter's where we'll be looking in just a moment. As I previously shared with you, the, the bulk of this letter deals with apostasy. Now, the apostate is, is not someone who was saved and kind of lost their salvation or fell away from their salvation. The true apostate, according to Scripture, is someone who, who goes through the motions of being a believer, but they're false. They're like the false prophets and the false teachers. And, you know, it's, Jesus gave the, the parable of the wheat and the tare. And how the tear, you know, they, they look like wheat, but they're not. They, they don't have any fruit on them. There's no head on it when it finally gets to the place where it should be producing fruit. Looks like wheat, but it's not. It's, it's a weed. It's not wheat. And there's a big difference between weeds and wheat. Amen. Uh, but when they grow together side by side, uh, it's pretty convincing in, in the early stages. Hey, that's all wheat, but it's not. And later on, it's proven for what it really is. That's why the Bible says you make your calling and your election sure, you know, be sure that you're not weeds, but you're wheat. And uh, the bulk of this letter is written about those who are weeds. And so he's telling them in the first chapter of this letter on apostasy to make sure that they know that they know they know that they know they know Jesus. Amen. So let's look at these, let, the, the, these verses. We've looked at them now. This is the six week ongoing in Second Peter chapter Chapter one, starting with verse two, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, seeing as his divine power has granted to us everything. You might want to underline that that pertains to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue. So you see, he's saying, hey, we truly know the Lord Jesus Christ. God's given us what we need to know him and to grow in him and to be what he's called us to be as a godly person. So he's called us by his own glory, by his own excellence, for by these, his glory and his excellence, he has granted to us his precious, magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason, also apply all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence or virtue, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control. In your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Verse 8, as he goes on with this, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful 
in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For those who lack these qualities, blind, short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. The goal here is to be what he's talking about, this stable, productive, useful Christian. I mean, that, that's the motivation. And that's the part of verse 8 where he says, hey, if they, these things are yours and you're growing in these areas of your Christian life, you're adding these qualities and these characteristics to your faith in Jesus Christ, then you won't be that kind of person who's unproductive and useless and unfruitful in their Christian walk in life. You don't have to live always stumbling. All right? Now, I know it's possible to be saved and not grow in these areas. And what happens? Well, you're usually not being fruitful and you're stumbling over and over and over again. So what do you do? You have discipline to add these things to your life. This is the method, he's basically, for, for being that fruitful, mature, productive, successful Christian in your walk. All right? Because you've taken... This position of giving your heart and life to Jesus. You've come to Christ in faith. And now I love what it says. But, so you're applying all diligence in your faith. Let me get, let's make this clear. This is not something we're sitting around waiting for. This is not something we're just kind of raising hands and say, thank you, Jesus. You've given it. This is things that you do. God has done everything he says necessary for life and godliness. Now you need to do this. God's given you everything you need. Now you need to do this. God's supplied all you need, but you need to do this. But how often do Christians say, well, I don't, you know, my, my faith is by grace. There's no works. Hey, faith without works is dead. And he said, and he used this word about diligence and he uses it twice in this passage. Be diligent about this. I mean, don't be slack. Don't be lazy. You know, get busy. Because there's some things you need to do because you believe, because you have faith, because you are a child of God, because you truly call to God, you know, take on a different mindset of, of, of adding. And it's basically seven steps to fruitfulness and usefulness. So I add to my faith virtue, to that knowledge, to that temperance, to that patience, to that godliness and to that brotherly kindness. And six and seven are what we'll deal with this morning. And add to brotherly kindness, what? Love or charity, as the King James says. The, by the way, if you look at these carefully, of these seven, the first five of those things, those pertain to you and your inner life and yourself and your personal walk and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The last two relate to others. And by the way, the last two are what's important. Because if you really are doing these other things, I believe this becomes the natural outflow. This, this is where you move from here. That there's no longer about me now. I've added to my faith these elements. And what it produces is a work of grace and God moving in my heart and life so that there, there's an exercise uh, of these last two things of, of brotherly kindness and charity. Now, if you look at these words carefully, uh, brotherly kindness or, and love, people say, well, that, that's kind of the same thing. Well, it's really not. And I want to talk about the difference between those and the application of those today. As you look at the Greek word for brotherly love, our, our, we would say in the English version, brotherly love. But in the Greek language, it's just one word. Now, it's made of two Greek words, but it's just one word. It's Philadelphia. Well, you're familiar with that, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The, the goal of this particular word, though, the, it has to do with a, a deep affection for someone, by the way, other than yourself. All right. It's brotherly kindness. It, it, it's, as I said, it's two Greek words. Philos is one word and Adelphos is the other. Philos, philos is the word for, for, you know, a friend, you know, or acting friendly and, and being a friendly person. Adelphos, it, it, that connective word here is, is it, the word Delphos, meaning from the womb, but it means like a, a, a brother. So he's saying what we do now as Christians, we relate to other people with a brother love. All right. With a brother love, not just a friend, not just a relationship, not just some, somebody we know, but we treat them as though they were a family member. Now, with family members, we can be a lot more patient. Most of the time we are a little more patient with family members. With family members, we show a little more cooperation. And lest you misunderstand this, you know, this really, this isn't a, a suggestion from the Lord, all right? This has to do with getting out and away from ourselves. There's nothing in these verses, by the way, 
that line up with current psychology and current, you know, sociology and philosophy of the day, which says, love yourself. None of that's in these verses. None of that's in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. In fact, if you, as close as you can find that, it says, love yourself. No, he says, love your brother like you love yourself. It's taken for granted, in other words, that we love ourselves. Why? Because we are by nature self-lovers. All right? We love ourselves. And that'll be the predominant theme, by the way, of the end times. Jesus gives us the, the clear indication through, through the apostles that the end times will be marked by selfish love. In the last days, men shall be lovers of what? Their own selves. Not only do we, our lovers, we preach it, we teach it, we, we promote it in the school systems. It, it's the common theme for the day. Self-love. But self-love, you know, that's just taking, we all love ourselves. Well, well Paul, you know, the problem with our, our people today and young people today is they just don't love themselves. No, the problem is they love themselves too much. I really, even the person who sits around and says, oh, I just don't love myself. I don't like myself. I don't like myself. I'm going to kill myself. Suicide's the most selfish thing anybody can ever do. When taken down to the nuts and bolts of it, it's all about self and putting yourself and thinking of yourself and considering yourself long before anybody else. Now, that's, so we don't need that instruction, love yourself, a contrary, again, to cultural popular opinion. We need the, we need the instruction that says, love others more than you love yourself. More than you, because, again, we love ourselves naturally. So he says here, hey, hey if everything you add to your faith he didn't say, and add to your faith with all diligence, supply self-love. That's amazing to me because that's the message today. He says, in all diligence, apply to your, your faith, loving others. And treating the, your brothers in Christ, the church, the family of God, with love. In fact, this is a commandment. This is not a suggestion unless you think it's something that sounds like a nice suggestion. Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Now he's talking to Christians about, guess what? Other Christians, your brothers, your sisters in the Lord. Look around the room. There's some here today. All right. You love the church. In fact, the apostle later on, the apostle John writes the fact, the evidence of, of salvation. He says, we know that we're the children of God because we love one another. He's talking about because you're a Christian, one thing that's manifest in your life is a brotherly affection and a brotherly kindness and an honoring of other Christians. You love the family. You realize that you and the people around you, your family, because we're under the blood of Jesus, because we're at the cross, because we're in Christ, it makes us family. We all have one father. You know, red and yellow, black and white. We are precious. We're the family of God in his sight. But we ought to be holding each other precious in our sight that we truly embrace an attitude of loving, not just tolerating, not just putting up, not just rolling your eyes. Well, you know, he's one of my brothers. I guess God got love him. You know, we got some strange family members in the, in, in the bride. All right. Don't look at me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm normal, right? <laughs> There's some strange brothers. And what are we called to do? We're called to love. We're called to, to express a, a, an, a, an affection that you would show for somebody in your own family. That kind of relationship. And the, I know also in the end times it says they'd also be without, you know, without, without natural affections. And that's the word astorgy means without family affection even. And that's certainly cultural today. There's everything anti-family you can get about the culture we live in. But as Christians, that's not us. We, we, love the, we, we love the body of Christ. We love other Christians. And it, once you get this in your head and mind, then you'll begin, to, you'll begin to love the variety of your brothers and sisters. All right? That God has so uniquely made us and has called us in all our uniqueness and all our, our diversity even just to be one in him. We're to be kindly affectionate. And I love this word he uses here. And this is this next word I'll show you from this passage. He says, I think it's really the key to what brotherly love is. He says, in honor, preferring one another. That's the Greek word time. We, you would say in English, I think it's just time, but that's, that, even though it's not related, time's not related to this, it certainly is in, in some form. If we really do show affection, so I'm going to spend some time on them, amen, and commit some time towards them. But it literally means to prize somebody more than you do yourself. It's the whole, it's, it's, it's a word which literally means what Jesus expressed 
in the Sermon on the Mount when we love, each, love others when we love ourselves. That we honor people. This, this is the key to, to unity in the church. This is the key to fellowship in the church. That we do prize one another above ourselves. Now that's hard to do because we, awfully, we, we certainly prize ourselves in a lot of different ways. But he said, I want you to do it more than you. I want you to, to honor other people more than you would honor yourself. To pay attention, to regard others more than you regard yourself. It's the word used in Revelation. In Revelation, the, 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 the heavenly host are around the throne of God and they're singing to the Lamb of God and they're saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive the glory. And what? And the honor and the power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they were created. What are we doing? They're honoring God. They're setting God above themselves. They're regarding God. And he says, what do you want you to do? That we not only honor God, <coughs> we honor men. We honor the brothers in Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another. That's what it means. I take time to consider you who you are, what your needs are, what God's doing in your life. How can I minister to you? How can, and he says here, consider one another, provoking one another. Now, some of us are pretty good at provoking. He said, but what we ought to do is provoke one another into love and to, and, and, and to good works. This is, this, is, this is such a command because we are family and family needs to regard each other and family needs to pay attention to each other. And we say, well, you know, I'll check in, I'm on the holidays. That's not what this is all about in reality. But not only is, is it commanded, it, it's, it's a certain word to believers they can't ignore because this is the expectation from on high that God has for each and every one of us. In Galatians, it says, when we, as we have the opportunity, let's do good unto all men, but especially, most importantly, unto those who are our Christian brothers and sisters, unto the household of God. Those are powerful words, but so often overlooked. We just go to church, we do our thing, we pat others on the back, but to really consider and to really reach out and to really say, I want to pray for you. I want to bear your burden. I want to minister to you in some regard. What did Paul say? He said, listen, we're not strangers anymore. We're not foreigners anymore to this, to each other. We are to this world. We are fellow citizens with the saints of God. We belong to the household of God. So we have this responsibility. And again, can I, can I emphasize this? this? This is an expectation. It's a commandment that God gives us. This is not something left up to our personal preference of who I want to like and who I don't want to like and who I want to fellowship with and who I don't want to fellowship with. This is, this is the word to each and every one of us. Now I know that, that some folks, this is easy for you, all right? With some people, this is easy. There's some folks I just love. I just love to be around them. I like to be around them. I like to, and you, why is that? Because they're kind of like me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So it's easy. That's kind of selfish, isn't it, at that point in reality? But there's a lot of folks not like me at all. But if all I do in the church is just kind of focus on folks that are like me, I miss what this is really all about. And I miss expressing the life of Jesus to those people around me as well. And I miss using my gifts in their life and then benefiting from the gifts that God's given me. And I miss benefiting from the gifts that God's given them for me. So I can't be selective in this process and say, well, I'll fellowship with you, but I won't fellowship with you. Now the Bible makes it clear the only time we should be selective in that regard is when they refuse to be obedient to the word of God. That they're not our close fellowship anymore. We serve as a warning saying, hey, you need to get your life right. I, I hold you accountable. You're my brother in Christ. I, you, need to, you need to respond to what God's telling you to do. You need to, you need to straighten up. All right, that's, but that's part of this whole idea of honoring people and loving people. And being faithful. But it's not just a commandment. The idea here is that it's not something I do today because I preached on it today. Because re Christians are really good at checking off the box. You know what I'm talking about? We go to church and we hear a sermon on giving, so we give that Sunday. I check the box off. We heard a sermon on witnessing, so uh, I'll go pass out some tracks today. Check the box off. I know I'm going to do it tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, but I check the box off today. I had that whole series on prayer. I checked the box. <laughs> that's not grace living. That's legalism. Grace living realizes the glory and the presence and the grace of God in my life each day. And I just want to live for him. And out of my love relationship with him, I, I want to I be with him. I want to walk with him. I want to serve him. I want to I wanna recognize him. I want to be recognized by him. I, I want his presence in my life. I want to know his presence in my life every day. And there's a big difference between that and kind of checking the box religion. 
So it's not something we just do today because we heard about it. On, uh, the preacher preached on today, so I'll be cognizant at least this week maybe of it. But this is, this is to be a continuing issue in, in my life. In Hebrews 13, there's this, this, he says, let brotherly love continue. That's a, that's a word in the Greek language. It's meno, which means to, 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 it abides. It, it, it endures, you know, it remains, it's present. It, it, it's not something that's in and out, up and down. This, this is, part, this is a, now, it's now a character quality of my life. This is something I have by faith diligently added to because God's given me the strength to do it because he's given me everything that pertains to life and godless. So therefore, I'm going to love my brother today because God's going to give me the capacity to love my brother. He told me to do it. I'm adding it to my faith. And now it's going to be a part of my life, a part of my walk and a part of my Christianity. It's being added. And he says it's, it's an attitude of diligence, you know. And, and that kind of brotherly love and that attitude, it doesn't rise and fall with circumstances. It doesn't rise and fall based upon situations or happenings or my emotions or my feelings. It, it goes on. Now, follow, follow me here with a little bit of this. this. This brotherly love and love, I really believe God dealt with all these other inward issues, those five elements he dealt with first that dealt with the inner person before he got to this because I need some work, all right? There's some things I need to do in my heart and life as I respond. And to be, to be a persevering and to be godly, you know, and to, and to have virtue in my life. As I respond, I believe that, that that's being developed as God's working in my heart and life. It, it's kind of like a house that's being built. There's a foundation. And then, then there's the framing, you know, and then there's the walls and the roof. As all this comes about and takes picture, you know, a dwelling place happens. What happens in my life as I'm building, I believe, and maturing in grace, this starts to flow is an outflow of my obedience to God's word and my diligence to add in faith what God's told me in his word. I think it, it, it happens as a, as a supernatural byproduct. Now, let me give you a scripture, I think, that, that says this very clearly. This is the outcome of, of growth and of our sanctification. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, it says, seeing that you have, you have purified your souls. How'd that happen? By obeying the truth through the spirit unto the unfeigned love of the brethren that you love one another with pure heart fervently. What's he saying? That when you start obeying the truth and God starts working in you and he starts cleaning your life out and that's the sanctification process where the spirit of God's working in you because you're, you're hearing God's spirit and you're responding to the truth and you're obeying God's spirit and as you do that, what's happening? The spirit of God's enabling you. The spirit of God's filling you. The spirit of God's working in your heart and mind. And as you do that, guess what happens? That leads unto an unadulterated, unfeigned, not hypocritical, not phony, a genuine love for others that comes out of a pure heart. And it's a fervent love. He uses, first of all, to say that, the, that, the, that the Spirit's going to lead you to an unfeigned love of the brethren. That's that word Philadelphia. And he says, see that you Philadelphia each other. <laughs> God's going to lead you to Philadelphia, so Philadelphia. God's going to lead you to brotherly kindness, so exercise kindness, brotherly kindness with a pure heart and do it fervently. Boy, I tell you that uh, there's, just, there's just no substitute for having, being that kind of person that embraces people and loves people and cares about people. That lady visit the church and she's back today or not saying, you know, during the welcome time, she thought she's going to be hugged to death. <laughs> welcome to death. That's good that, that we be that kind of church. But that's a, not just for visitors at welcome time. That's for the body of Christ and for the fellowship of the brothers. So the godliness that we talked about and the perseverance and the patience and all those elements of our life, that be, results in brotherly kindness and it results in, in as, a, as I believe, as a byproduct into the love of God. Now, as you study the rest of 2 Peter, he starts talking about the false believers and although they appear to be godly, they're not really godly because they don't have any love for anybody but themselves. And it's all about what they can get out of the deal and who's, what's, going to, what's going to bless them. And how you can help me instead of how, what I can do for you. That's where we miss the mark. He says, so add to brotherly kindness. Then he throws in this word charity. And that's the way the King James and just New American Standards and others say love. I think King, King, King James is specific because it, it's notating a different word from just the word love that's throughout many places in the scriptures. Which is that word phalos for family love or storge, which is a family type of love or, or you know, or, or even a sensual kind of love. The eros you know, he uses this word agape love. 
It's, it's, it's first love he mentions here, this brotherly kindness, this brotherly love. It's, it's, it's the Philadelphia, the second word used here, this different kind of love. It's a copy love. It's, it's God-like love with no interest. It's not self-serving. It cares about people. It loves people. It wants to minister to people. It understands the big picture. It's a simple comparison between these two. Philadelphia is to love as a friend. The, 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 the Greek dictionary put it like this, to uh, a fond of an individual or object I have affection for, denote personal attachment, a matter of sentiment or feeling. While agape, on the other hand, it's much broader than that, wider than that. It embraces especially judgment and deliberate assent of your will. You make bi- biblical judgments and biblical decisions to love, to prize, to care for somebody, not just the brothers, not just the church, but who? Everybody. This lost world. For God so agape. All right? it's, it's, it's a broader term. It has to do with sacrifice. That we love on a completely different scale. Both words are found in some verses in scripture. Philadelphia and agape. In 1 Thessalonians. But touching brotherly love. Philadelphia. You need not that I write to you. For you're taught of God to agape. Love one another. All right. We're supposed to love one another. It's a natural flow, but agape even goes further than that. In, in Romans 12, it says this, let love, not agape, be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectioned to one another with Philadelphia, with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. So we see that there's two very distinct things here. There's me, first of all, loving the brothers and the sisters in Christ. And then there's the other of loving everybody, loving a lost world, loving all people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do I do? I add to my brotherly love. I add to my brotherly kindness. I add to that charity. It's conveyed really clearly in 1 Thessalonians. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another and toward all men, even as we do towards you. We've set an example, he said. You love each other. For the Christian, that should be the natural, supernatural, normal thing. We ought to love each other. It's who we are in Christ. We're, we recognize that we're family. We recognize we're children of God. But now he says, don't just stop there. That happens too often in the church. We stop with brother love and forget the rest of the world. They're not like us. They don't like what we like. They don't do what we like. They say bad words. They go to bad places. They do bad things. They're bad people. I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. So we have this idea that separation means we completely isolate ourselves and we don't love them. But just the opposite is true. I'm not going to be like them. I'm not to be conformed to what they're conformed to, but I am certainly to reach out to them and love them, love all men whether they're like me or not, whether they like the same things or not, love one another. That's, that's grace. And that does, by the way, take God. That takes the grace of God. And you have to realize that all these ultimately take the grace of God, but they're all, they all begin with add to your faith. (laughs) All right. We start with faith, my love for Jesus, my commitment to Christ, my commitment to God's word. Therefore, I can take all diligence to supply these characteristics to my walk in life. The source, as we said, is God. This is God-like love. John 15, 9, the Father loved me, so I've loved you. Continue you in my love. All right, God, God loves you. I love you. I've given you this love. Now you walk in my love. Romans 5 puts it this way. Hope makes not a shame because the love of God, that's agape, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto you. Just pause for a moment, read that again, look at it carefully, because what is he saying? He said, God has shed his love in your, abroad in your heart. God's given you his love in your heart by his Holy Spirit. So when you say, I just can't love them, well, you need to give your life to Jesus or understand what the Bible teaches, that you can love them because you can. How do you love them? With the love of God. How do you do that? You love them. You make a choice. You make a conscious, deliberate decision and the scent of your will, so to say, that you choose to make a deliberate commitment. I'm going to love them. Why? Because God's given me the capacity to love everybody. I don't have that in myself, but praise God, I do have the source for that. And the source for that is God himself. In fact, Galatians 5 tells us the fruit of the spirit is love. 
It's, it's, when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you have what you need. So the source is God, but the course of it is, all right, it flows to, to us and it flows to sinners. God committed his love, that agape, toward us that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. <clears throat> Understand, this, the, the flow of God's grace is to sinners. Will you be the sinner that receives it? I did, and I do, all right? I've given my life to Christ. So God demonstrated and commended his love toward me. Displayed, demonstrated, and literally he gave it, all right? He manifested his love. And how was it seen? How was it given? Through the cross of Jesus Christ. Christ died for us. We see in John, John 15 where it says, greater love has no man than he would lay down his life for his friends. Now, praise God that Jesus laid down his life not just for his friends, he laid down his life for sinners. Here's the thing about it. We're all sinners, all needing the grace of God. For me to be selective of who I'm going to love and show compassion towards is ridiculous. It doesn't fit in the biblical scenario for Christian. Now I choose, now I've been called upon, now God's given me the capacity, he's the source, the flow of it's now coming to my life, all right? I'm now surrendering to love others. Here's the power of it all. It gets out of me now. It flows out of me and it literally controls my life and makes a difference because now if I'm letting God control my mind and life like that, I begin to convey that same love. For 1 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ controls me. It controls us, concluding that one died for all, therefore all have died and he died for all so that they might live no longer for themselves. In other words, why did the, this love come to me? Because God, God loved me. But it also comes with a power and a capacity and ability and a force that gives me the strength to look beyond myself now and to love others as I would love myself, to love others more than I love myself. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't get that far with so many churches and so many Christians. We, we kind of come in, we hear about it, we applaud it, we rejoice in it, we memorize the verses. But when it comes to stepping out into the world, in the actual culture in which we inhabit all around us, we don't demonstrate a lot of that love. We don't, we're not willing to die. So brother Joe, I'm willing to die for, for people. I'd take a bullet. Here's what it means to take the bullet in the Christian sense. It means that when, this, when, when you know there's somebody near you that needs a word from God, you're willing to take the bullet right then and there, die to yourself and share that word with them. Hello. <laughs> this, this calls for faith. This calls for faith that leads to courage. This calls for a faith that believes God. It calls for a faith that takes it to the next step for us. It, it calls for a faith that we abandon ourselves and say, I'm not going to love myself. Well, what's it mean there? Well, it means something like this. Well, I know I need to share Christ with that person and I know I need to do it, but you know, what will they think about me? That's nothing but pride and arrogance. What are you doing? You're loving yourself. What will they think about me? What will they say about me? What will be the conclusion about me? Well, the love of Christ will lead you away from that me mindset. When you step out and choose to be that supernatural person and you choose to step out and be what God's called you to be and you speak the words of grace and the gospel message to a lost world, what are you doing? You are sacrificing yourself for others. You're sacrificing your pride for others. You're sacrificing the opinion that others might have you because you realize the most important thing that that person ever needs to hear. I don't care who they are, what they need to hear is the truth of God's word and the gospel message of Jesus Christ. In fact, folks, if, if we stop here, then it's like, it's like heresy. It, it, it becomes, we're almost like the apostates in so many ways because we're still selfish. We're still holding on to the greatest treasure of all time in all history. We'd embrace it for ourselves. There's no love there. There's no brotherly kindness there. So I think it's, like I said, it's important that he deals with these first five issues and dealing with us. So we come to the place of humility. So we come to the place of teachability. So we come to the place of dependence upon God so that now God can take us and use us in each other's lives and in the world. If we miss that, we miss the mark, wouldn't you say? It's the force of, of, of God's word and God's love. When we let it take root in our own heart and life, the proof of that love 
is a life that lives like a light, a life that cares about other people. It's one thing to give 10 bucks to somebody on the street. It's another thing completely of much greater value to share the word of God. You know what Peter said at, at, at the gate when they go up to the temple? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Now that may not be what they wanted to hear because it won't buy a Bud Light. But it'll certainly what they need. So instead of cursing the darkness as it's been said so eloquently, let's light a candle. Instead of trying to show how disgraceful something is, why don't we just make it a graceful, filled moment with God's word and see what God has to say. I mean, God, one thing about the love of God, it, it appears, all right? It demonstrates, it shows up. It, it, it makes itself known. It, the character of God's love is demonstrated in John three sixteen. It, it, uh, the, just that it's because God cared for us, he gave. How's it demonstrated in our life? How's it gonna be demonstrated in your life? When, when we leave here today or into this week, it'll be demonstrated we love because we give ourselves for others. We care about their needs, where they're headed and what eternity is all about. Because the greatest need any person you will meet this week be the need for an eternity with Jesus Christ more than any other need in their life. Do you know Jesus? Where are you going to spend eternity? Where are you going to go when you die? If you die today, where would you spend eternity? If you had to stand before God, what, what would you tell God to let you get you in heaven? Well, I've got some good news for you that you can know and you can be sure and that God loves you and God's got purpose and direction, reason for your life. He'll change you radically and forgive your sin. Let me close with this one verse. From 1 John 4, by this, this shows the source, the force, and the course, all of it. By this is the love of God. That's the source. Manifest in us. Where? God manifested. That he sent his only begotten son into the world. That we might love through him. And, and this love, not, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, he's come now to the course that is us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love others. That's the force of it in action, in our lives and through our lives. The power of love, the power of love. This is so true. And I mean, you can take this simple lesson, apply it to your marriage. You have revival in your home overnight. Of preferring others before you prefer yourself. It'll radicalize your home. It'll radicalize your job. You know, it'll rad radicalize your neighborhood. It's radical. The love of God is crazy radical. But yet we're trying to be too sane and too sober and be decent little church members. Carry little Bibles into church and look so good. Maybe put a little bumper sticker on the car. God loves you. So do I. If we love people, we ought to take time to speak to people. And say, you know, I love you enough. I don't know how you're going to receive this, but I got to tell you something. I'm going to tell you what happened in my life. It changed me. It's important. Be that kind of person. That's a true lover. So he said, you add to your faith diligently. And what's it produce in your life? It's going to produce a relationship between you and other people in the fellowship that's deeper and more unique. And it's going to produce a relationship with lost people that you're going to be able to impact the world around you. If it stops short of that, we're useless and fruitless, as he said. I don't want to live that way to you. I don't think you do. I think you want to live on a higher level. I think God's called us to a higher level of living than what traditional churchism is all about. God's called us to be impact people. He's called us to be impact people in each other's lives. He's called us to be impact people in the world around us. We're that person that's different. We're that individual who's not going to shut up. We're, he's going to, he's going to just, he's, we're that person who's going to love them no matter what. Where that person is going to care for him no matter what. We're going, to, we're going to be the person who keeps presenting Jesus. And sometimes even if that person keeps messing up, like I said, it may be in a corrective mode. But we're going to love them enough to, to have the guts to correct them. And say, listen, I'm concerned about you, brother. I think you're heading the wrong way, sister. Let me pray for you. I want you to not care about you. But what you're doing, where you're going, what you're, how you, it's, not, it's not right. Those are the people that truly, radically change the world around them. No turning back, but there's no sitting still either. Let's move forward. And if we're growing in grace and maturing in grace, as we see from this passage, 
and it's going to lead us outside of ourselves. If we're still stuck internally, we're not making any difference eternally. That's not what we're sitting here for, is it? We're to make an eternal difference. Let's stand with our heads bowed.